So welcome to today's episode of Learning Unbox. Um, I am super excited as always because we have a great guest today. Uh, we are going to be talking with Lisa Chambers um, of TechCore about the role of technology in K-12 education, the, the status at the moment, the view for the future, um, and sort of what we can expect and be planning on. And just a little bit of uh, background um, about Lisa. Um, she has more than 20 years of experience in building building cross-sector strategic alliances and developing nationally recognized and award-winning computer science and information technology programs specifically in that K-12 space, which is why we're so excited to be speaking with Lisa today. Um, and in 20, let's see, in 1999, um, she was the state director um, for Ohio's chapter of TechCore. And then in 2011, she was named the TechCore National Executive Director. So Lisa, thank Thank you for joining the program. Thanks for having me. So first and foremost, um, you know, to give a bit of context to our listeners, um, out of full fairness, I've known Lisa for many years now. We, we, we bump into each other, we've had great opportunities to get to do some planning and some, some, some programming work together. And we're involved with a lot of the same partners and schools and spaces. And so I'm super excited to have this conversation today because TechCore is a program um, that at past we, we, we view highly favorable. In fact, we, we recommend it for frequently and so it's a great conversation to be able to have. So for our listeners, Lisa, who come to us from all over the world um, and who are not going to be familiar with what TechCore is, give us the 100,000 foot view of this organization. I mean, you notice I went all the way to the very top. <laughs> well, I think our founder would say, Gary B2, who founded TechCore back in 1995, his original vision of TechCore was almost like a high-tech Peace Corps. Hmm. So when, when Gary launched TechCore back in the mid 90s, if you think back to where we were with technology and education at that time, that was early on, mm -hmm. right? I mean, students were really just starting to think about, you know, how to integrate technology into the teaching and learning process, you know, what to do with this new thing that we called the World Wide Web, right? Yes. <laughs> um, and so Gary thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could figure out a way of connecting technology professionals with schools in their communities to, to lend a hand and, and to lend a hand in whatever way made sense, Annalise. And so early on, TechCore volunteers could spend a weekend wiring school buildings when we were still using wire. Wow. Or setting up some of the first computer labs in elementary schools. Um, and so if you fast forward, we have evolved as the space has evolved. And so now um, I like to say we kind of, we do two things. We, we still engage technology professionals um, who go out into their community and teach kids about technology and computer science. Um, the difference now is that we give them kind of a roadmap, right? We help them think about, you know, well, how do you teach, you know, coding to a third grader? Mm -hmm. um, so we give them a, a, a tech core program to go out and implement. So that's, that's kind of, you know, we, we still have that, that kind of that, that piece of the, the volunteers. And then we're developing, constantly developing computer science and technology programs for kids. Um, and that can be anything from just a, a short, you know, kind of um, awareness program, right? right. Um, so that might be a four hour, you know, robotics workshop with a group of Girl Scouts on a Saturday, all the way up to a deep immersion program, which we do with our high school kids, where we may have them for 200 or 300 hours in a program, mm -hmm. and they're walking out with either an industry recognized credential or college credit. So, um, so yeah. <laughs> so awesome. And I guess I did not realize that the origin story was around the infrastructure of just launching technologies in school. So I appreciate that very much because I did not realize that piece of the tech core backstory. I'm familiar with what I see and how past has worked with you over the years, which is really on that student programming side. And so I'm very familiar with that aspect of it and the volunteers coming in, but didn't really have a good sense of the fact that back in the day, 
day. You are roll up your sleeves and let's actually wire this place. Let's build a lab. Let's yeah. do not just the teaching and learning part, but the infrastructure piece as well. Yeah. One, I was just sharing with um, one of my colleagues that one of our early programs was a program called Web Teacher. And John Glenn actually was the narrator. And at the beginning of that video, and, it, and again, it was teaching teachers about how to use the internet in your classroom. And he described the internet um, using language that years ago was used to describe the chalkboard when the wow. chalkboard first entered the classroom. And I thought, isn't that the truth, right? Mm -hmm. and, and who would imagine, <laughs> you know, um, back in the 90s, when, when we were just starting to think about this, who would imagine that we'd be where we are today? Right, right. Um, yeah. And so, so much, so much exciting stuff going on, um, but still so much more work to do as, as you, you know so well. Isn't that the truth of it, right? You know, I because <clears throat> I've had some really fun conversations with our kiddos at PASS, a lot of the robotics kids in particular, you know, who will wax poetically about, you know, the things that they do. And they always start these conversations, and I'm sure you're familiar with this. Well, you know, our generation, as <laughs> if the rest of us, right, are so <laughs> clueless, for starters. I love that. I'm like, mm. Every time I hear that, I just want to shake my head. But, you know, I have pointed out to them that, you know, I am in fact old enough that I remember um, the first computer coming to somebody's home. I remember we, you know, well, one of those, you know, um, what, you know, uh, Texas Instruments computers with the um, with the tape drive, right? I, I vividly remember my grandpa, right, who was born in 1913, thought that was the coolest thing ever. And he went out and bought one and brought it home to us, right? So just, you know, like a crazy thing. And and I remember the first computer lab um, in, in, in my school when I was in middle school. And I remember the first computer science courses coming to a school district. And, you know, you had to go into a lottery to be able to get to be in the class because they were only going to teach like one one class of it and now and now it's you know it's perceived to be as not just a, a great opportunity but almost even and, and I totally approve of this in many ways you know uh, a foundational sort of right you have to have knowledge of the internet technology coding computer science to be fully literate so the world has in fact changed Absolutely. and so so lisa how do you there's still and um let, let me let me let me pause again circle back around with everything that's gone on with the pandemic and we'll get into some of the weeds of how that's affected a lot of of, of your work um you know over the last year or so but but it has also brought up a tremendous amount of inequities tied to technology in particular in our education space and so as you think about tech core's work not just in the pandemic or even in the past and in the moment but in the future how, what is the role? Because I assume that there is a role for tech core as it relates to sort of thinking about those inequities and the opportunity that has been brought forward because of all of this as we move forward. What does that look Absolutely. like? Absolutely. I mean, you know, and, and I was just having this conversation a couple of weeks ago with the former national director of, you know, she was thinking back about, Gosh, when she started, we were talking about the digital divide and here we are today still talking about it, you know? And while there's been a lot of progress in some ways, there just, there hasn't been mm -hmm. in, in too many ways. Right. Um, and, and some of those inequities that, that we saw back in, in the 90s, you know, we're, we're still experiencing mm -hmm. now. Um, and I feel like it's almost you know, it's more crucial now, right? Because there's so much that you have to do, you know, online, you know. Um, everything, almost right? everything, right? right? I mean, and the things we can't do are kind of mind boggling because we can actually physically do them. There's just policy that says we cannot, right. which is confusing too, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and we know that other countries have figured this out, right. you know, and so I, I think part of it is, it's just us making a commitment that, mm -hmm. that this is something that is a basic skill and right, and that all kids, all families, regardless of where they live, where, you know, um, that, that they should have access mm -hmm. and, and exposure. And we just know that that still is not the truth. And so I think for an organization like ours, 
that's why it's even more important for us to to really raise that flag and raise our voices around this, you know, and and we had been doing that work prior to, mm -hmm. to, to the pandemic, you know, and really have a deep feeling that all kids, regardless of their race, regardless of their gender, their zip code, you know, where their parents work, that they should have access to high quality computer science programs. Um, and that's just not true, right? right. And in, in a lot of ways, I think we thought once we bought hardware that we had solved the issue. But now mm -hmm. what we know is that you can walk into a great, you know, computer lab and they're using it to teach typing. Right. Or they're doing drilling kill, you know, right. um, to prep for the test. They're not teaching computer science. Right. They're not teaching, you know, the skills that we know um, kiddos need to, to, to be successful, regardless of what they decide to do. Um, and so I think for us, we want to draw that attention because I've, a lot of parents I've talked to, they were surprised. They thought, I guess, you know, when I went in and I saw that lab that I just thought that they were using it for more than, than, than they were. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and so now I'm often saying to folks, you know, ask the question, yeah. you know, yeah, it's a great space, but what do you, what do we do it here? Yeah. You know, and are we are we teaching our kids to become creators and designers or are we just pushing them through, you know, and, you know, practicing for for the test? And, right. and so I think those are the, the questions that we want to make sure that that folks are asking and that we're thinking about mm -hmm. um, and understanding that this really is a, a is a global issue for us. Right. I mean, that if we're not preparing all kids, if we're not bringing diverse, you know, thoughts and ideas to the table that, that it's going to affect our competitiveness as a nation. Mm -hmm. And right now we're just not, we're not doing it as we right. should be. I mean, we know that women make up more than 50% of the workforce. They're 26% of the mm -hmm. IT profession. Mm -hmm. When you drill that down even further, let's talk about black women, mm -hmm. 3%, 3%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I mean, so I think about, think about all of the talent, all of the ideas, all of the innovations and the solutions that aren't here because we're not in the room. Right. Because we're not putting them on the table. We're not right. even making it part of our conversation. And yeah. it's not lack of talent. It's right. lack of opportunity. opportunity. Yep. And so I think mm -hmm. for us as an organization, that's why, while we work with all kids, we do make a commitment to making sure that we're getting to those kids who you know, may not have access to, to these types of programs during the school day, or may not live in communities, you know, or, or have a parent who understands the importance of sending their, their, their child to a, a STEM, you know, mm -hmm. camp in, in the summer, or, or even has the resources to do that. And so, so we do really say we want to make sure that we're getting to those kids because the talent is there. Mm -hmm. um, we just have to provide them access and invite them in, right? Right, right. right. And show them once we even provided the access and invited them in that it's it's not just a viable career opportunity, but it's something that they can tap into their own passions and turn into a career. Um, you know, and you and I have have been involved in these conversations many times before around the fact that you can't be what you can't see, but you can't do what you don't know, right? And so we we have to think about this problem extremely holistically um, and make sure that the opportunity is more than just a time and a place that it incorporates all these other components. So I want to dig into that just a little bit because the work that you're doing um, in the informal sort of after school setting, and you, do, you guys do a lot of that, but you're also doing some pretty specific work inside the school day at districts, whether it's, you know, professional development, just getting folks comfortable back to that statement that you made earlier, which I truly, truly appreciated. You know, you walk into these labs and whole and behold, you know, we're only teaching typing or we're teaching to the test. And that's not because the facility is not capable. It's because the instructional opportunity is not there for a variety of reasons, right? I, a teacher is not comfortable. The teacher didn't have the right training. The school's not really pushing that agenda, a whole host of things. So I wanna talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts about how you change the paradigm around making sure the opportunity exists within the school structure. It's, it's a whole nother endeavor to try to get people in the after school and summer space as we know that's also a, a huge lift. But you know we have these captive 
audience, so to speak, right? During, during the day. And yet, so how do we change the tide in that moment, Lisa? Yeah. Um, so we, we last, this, this last year, year before, um, we headed up a project here in partnership with the Teaching and Learning Collaborative um, that really looked at computer science ecosystems. And one of the things that we decided we wanted to do was to um, commission a, a landscape a uh, study, if you will, to see what, what does computer mm -hmm. science look like? You know, what does access, who's teaching, where are they teaching? And so we did, we, we focused on the 11 counties, kind of the, what we refer here to as Central Ohio, right, right. and sent out a teacher survey. Um, and a couple of things, Annalise, that I'm sure you won't find surprising, but you know, again, I think when we think about the work that needs to be done, one of the biggest barriers was the lack of professional development for teachers in the area of computer science. And as you can imagine, that, that lack of access was greater for teachers at those earlier grade levels, sure, right? Sure, Because even in this country where, and this is kind of across the board in the United States where we are teaching computer science, it's traditionally at the high school yeah. level. Mm -hmm. Um, the challenge about that is that the research tells us that if we don't engage girls and black and brown students by elementary school, even if they attend a school district where there is a computer science option in high school, the likelihood that they're in that course is, is, is less, right? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and you can walk into, I think, many, many computer science high school classrooms, and you'll see that it looks very much like the tech industry looks, right? Yes. Yep, absolutely. So... Our, our, our partner with the Teaching and Learning Collaborative, and I know you know them well, but the work that they do around professional development with teachers is just outstanding. Mm -hmm. And so a number of years ago, our two organizations joined and said, we want to do some work together um, as it pertains to computer science. And, and so we applied for a, a math, mathematics science partnership grant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And MSP, yep. Yeah. Uh -huh. And yep. And and so there were a couple of things that we thought about. We said, well, we really want to think about teachers in these lower grade levels, mm -hmm. right? Like where is that that first drop-off point for kids? Let's focus there. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of great curriculum out there for, for, for the higher grade levels. And then we thought, okay, what's the challenge of teaching computer science in elementary school? Mm -hmm. One, you've got one teacher who's right, a generalist who teaches everything. Everything, yep. <laughs> and so you're like, okay, then how do we make it easy -er for our teachers to integrate computer science? Well, what if it's tied to? What if it's not an addition? What if it's not one more thing? Right. But what if we look at what they already need to teach and focus on and say, let's think about how could we you know, integrate there. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to focus on mathematics, yep. which I also think when you're talking about computer science, you get kids really excited about CS, but if they don't have a strong math foundation, they're going to hit a wall. Yep. Um, and so we need to power them up in both areas. And so this curriculum that we ended up and developed really looked at what were some of the areas that kids were struggling in as it pertains to mathematics. Mm -hmm. And could we use computer science concepts to make it a little bit more exciting yeah. to think about, you know, some of these math concepts in a different way? Mm -hmm. And so there um, we launched this program that we now call e for tech mm -hmm. And so it really was, um, you know, it's with MSP grants, they're, they're research grants, yep, right? Yep. So we wanted to look at... Um, increasing teachers' content knowledge in the areas of math and computer science, and then the same for, for our kiddos. And what I can say is that at that end of that, that project that we saw st statistically significant gains in the math scores of the, the kiddos whose teachers had gone through this program. Yeah. And we had teachers saying things like, you know, really what you taught me was to think differently about how I was teaching and how right. I was approaching that, right. you know, and they appreciated that they didn't have to, um, they didn't have to make the case, right. you know, for why they needed to also teach computer science, right. you know, right. it was just saying to them, you'd been using this to teach this math concept, 
Now, instead you can use this, right. you know? And one of the things um, we, we also had to do and we learned along the way is we had to develop look for us for our administrators mm-hmm. so that they understood when they walked into those classrooms that it might look a little different mm-hmm. than what, you know, they were used to seeing but that there was a connection, you know, and it tied back to the standards for math and we would get the kids there, you know, and, you know, and I I think we were just blown away with, with what these teachers were able to do and how it was able to transform how they, they taught and thought about, you know, mathematics and computer science. And, you know, and to hear teachers saying, you know, my kids were running in and saying, is it E for tech day? Is it E yeah. for tech day? Which really they were saying, is it math day? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's exactly what we wanted them um, to do. So, so that's been really exciting work um, mm-hmm. to, to think about how do we, how do we make sure that more kids and more teachers, you know, in the state have access to programs like that? Um, and, and we're still trying to figure that out. <laughs> I, I think we all are right, but I do I do love and truly truly appreciate the fact that uh, you know as as a, as a group as an effort through through that grant opportunity that you chose mathematics. I mean that is certainly one of the things that has been an area of research um, at past that we have focused on for a number of years. Um, you know that that the sort of realization and revelation, I guess if you will, right that. You know, there's there's so much work that's happening. You know, in literacies and reading and writing are you know super important. No one no one is arguing or debating that whatsoever. But what we have found over time has been, and the data supports it, is that um, you know if we only focus on reading and writing, math scores do not improve. But if the but the the but the converse is also not true in the sense that if we focus on mathematics as the primary driver for all literacies, all literacies improve. And so the fact that you're tying math and computer science um, back across, you know, the standards and the work that they're happening, it's only going to make everything go up. And although that may not have been what you measured um, through your MSP, that is so, so critically important. I just, I love that you went that direction. And so my follow-up question is, okay, you did that thing. So, so what's next? What, What do you do with this now? Well, I think that we we think about because as you know, you know, MSP went away as a yep. as a program. So we are um, we're going to take it to the National Science Foundation and, and hope we can you know um, get some support there. But we're also looking at at even some you know private funders mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as well. So we've been doing some work up in Cleveland um, that is privately funded and and want to continue to 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 build that out. We've also started to put, you know, some of the the lessons are out there. Mm -hmm. Um, But as you know, I think more than the curriculum is the professional development that goes Mm -hmm. with it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the key part. So you can put a lesson out, but I think unless you give those teachers kind of that PD and that that, that support that they need, Mm -hmm. you know, just, I I don't know that it have the same punch with with everybody, Um, but so I, you know, but again, I think we've, we've got to keep talking about the importance. And I know that you went through the process here of, mm-hmm. you know, with, when our state was going through, you know, um, focusing on the, the launch of the computer science standards yep. and the yep. conversation that was had there. And there's still just a lot of confusion there in this is. area, right? <laughs> I mean, so <laughs> I think for, you know, for those of us that work in this space, that that has become yet another bullet point on our mm-hmm. job descriptions, I think, is to mm-hmm. just make sure that our legislators and, and our communities really understand what we're talking about when we're talking mm-hmm. about computer science mm-hmm. and, and why it's important. And, and beyond just, because I think we often default to the workforce. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's bigger than that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and so I think it's important that we, we continue to have those conversations with folks and not just assume because everybody's walking around with the smartphone right. that, they, that they get it, yeah. right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The, in the same way that I'm sure you all, your parents say, oh yeah, my kid's been playing with an iPad since they were right. seven, you know, two years old. Right. Well, that doesn't make them a right. developer. Exactly. <laughs> so- right. right, yeah, we need to get to the point where folks 
you know, thinking about more than just, I have this thing, but that I know how not, and I, and more than I know how to use this thing, I actually know how to leverage this thing, right? right? Which you're never going to be able to do if you can't program code or at least understand the language that makes the tech possible and the way the tech works in your everyday life. Yeah. And I mean, I think when, when we think about the, the AI, I don't know if you've seen mm -hmm. coded bias yet, but uh -huh. um, I mean, just we yes. got to understand this mm -hmm. world that we live in and we've got to make sure that we really are critical thinkers mm -hmm. about what we're giving access to and what we're inviting into our spaces and our places um, and how it's, it's, it's controlled, you know, yeah. I mean, and, mm -hmm. and I just, you know, I, I, and I just watched something else. I can't remember what the name of it was. It was another, another movie about this, this whole piece with AI. Yeah. And I thought, taking back to my team to say, you know what, I want to develop a camp for high school mm -hmm. kids where we mm -hmm. start talking about this, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They need to under, because they're going to be the ones, right, that really can start to ask some hard questions about mm -hmm. what we're doing and what we're allowing right? Um, and figuring it out. And what do we do about it? Yeah. So let's go back to that conversation earlier about my generation. Okay, great. Awesome. Then you can be the empowered generation. You go and solve these issues. But if you don't understand the breadth and depth of what the issues really are, you're never going to be able to embrace that my generation approach and say, I'm going to solve this thing. Right. So, you know, when we, we think about, you know, um, equity and we think about the environment and we think about some really key things that this group of, you know, um, baby millennials or our Gen Zers um, and our alphas that are coming up very quickly right behind them, you know, they, they've, they've got they've got some, they've got something to launch onto, right? And they can, in fact, um, you know, solve those problems if, if we allow them. I want to talk just a little bit, sort of Lisa, about one of the other pieces that you mentioned, and I just want to be really clear because I think that this is sort of a global conversation that I'm hearing and seeing snippets about as it relates to sort of the how and when we engage students differently, especially especially thinking about computer science. And so, so sort of my own internal musing, which may be completely wrong and feel free to say, oh no, Annalise, that's BS, that's okay. But you know, I, I imagine and envision a day where we can stop having the conversation that, that is around, does your, your school teach computer science, right? And more of, you know, is computer science embedded in everything you do? How do we get there? And is that where we want to go? Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know because what I what I'd be concerned about is that depending on where we were, that that would get watered down. Yeah, diluted. That's always right? the fear. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, good good question. I I'm not sure how I, I don't I don't mm -hmm. know because it's the same, you know, I mean, I think the, the conversation over the last couple of years that's been bubbling up is, you know, conversation around computational thinking. Yes. And well, mm -hmm. shouldn't we be doing that everywhere? And don't we yes. do that all, everywhere? Well, maybe we do, but maybe we, no. maybe we don't. Maybe we don't do it, you know, as well <laughs> in some places as others. Right. And so I think that, you know, kind of just going to the, the equity piece of it is I'd want to be careful and mm -hmm. I'd want to really think through because I, I do want to, in the same way, you know, that we thought, right, we could buy these two boxes, right, these two computers, mm -hmm. and we drop them into two different classrooms, and it seemed like it was the same thing, and it seemed like it would be equitable, but we know now that it wasn't, right? Correct, that, correct, yeah. That they were used in different ways, and that a lot of time, you know, that track to where they were situated. Right, right, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, at least I'm going to think more about that one. <laughs> the answer either but you yeah. know it's one of the things that I just really really wrestle with and when I think about it in particular and so as we are getting ready to have you know our our first summer post pandemic with kids actually in the house with their hands on machines devices out you know out, out outside inside you you name it um, you know it just brings that question back to me around how we normalize 
the expectation, right, that that all kids, back to your point, um, can program, they can think, they're design thinkers, um, they're problem solvers, and they 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 understand and leverage the tools that they have, but they understand them as some as as tools to move them into another place, right? And that's a that's an even sort of bigger leap in many cases, especially when you think about the way you know our K twelve certainly in in the U.S. but other parts of the world as well are really really wrestling with how best to not just get kids what they need to move on and persist and be successful, but also what they need to be great global citizens, to be stewards of our planet, to be compassionate, empathetic individuals, and to and to lead their lives through some sort of passion. You know that that there should be more out there for us than just a thing we do for the sake of doing it. Yeah, yeah. And I think I'd add on to that and say that I think um, that's the one piece about this informal education space that really excites me. Mm -hmm, me too. And I was sharing um, with the colleague um, earlier today that we had a, um, a young woman in our program in one of our high school programs one year. And she turned out, she was just like a rock star. I mean, she just was awesome, you know? And so I was standing there one day and I talked to her and I said, you know, what other technology classes have you taken? And she was like, none. And I was like, are you serious? I was like, why not? And, and you seem to be so excited about it. She was like, yeah. She was like, well, but I was scared because I didn't want to take a class and not be good at it. And then it would impact my GPA. And I had never thought about that, mm -hmm. that in these informal spaces, it gives kids a chance to try something, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. there's so much pressure on our kids today, yeah. so much pressure to yeah. not fail, to always get the right answer, yeah. you know what I mean? And so, but in these informal spaces, you really can say, well, I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And here she learned that not only did she like it, but she was really good. good. Yeah. Um, yeah. And ended up and 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 went to to major in computer science. Um, but I thought that's such an important role for us to play mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is providing those spaces and then encouraging our kids to to take that chance, to try something new, mm -hmm. you know? And I often think, you know, with the kids that come through our program, I don't think that they'll all grow up to become software engineers or, you know, data analysts, but I hope that they'll make a more informed decision about mm -hmm. what they like and what they, they don't and what they, you know, might want to be or not, right. you know, and not mm -hmm. just say, you know, I'm not, yeah. you know, I'm not yeah. into that. Yeah. <laughs> without ever even trying it. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I completely agree with you. I mean, that I, we, I think that's the, the, the great value add that, that PAST has is our after school and summer programs. We, we put a tremendous amount of emphasis on them because back to your point, we have kids for a whole host of reasons who, who will come and spend six or eight weeks with us just going from program to program to program to program week after week after week after week. And I had somebody ask me one time, well, isn't that parenthetical to what you're hoping for? And, and my thought was, no, it's exactly what I'm hoping for because it's my hope that somewhere in that six to eight week journey, that kid will find the thing that makes them go, wow. And then we have them right now, now, now they're ours to nurture and to, to, to help them grow into whatever that thing is. But the flip side of it is they've learned about all the things they don't want to do. Yeah. And I bet the same is true for you as, as me. I can't, how many adults have I run into who have told me who will work in this space? And I'm like, how did you, how did you get uh -huh. into tech? Yeah. And it was, I was at a camp <laughs> or you know, it was in an after school program. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure there's also, you know, some that are saying, oh, I took this class in school. Yeah. But a lot of times it was something informal that they did Yeah, that they kind of just landed in like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if we can make it possible so that that informal space can bridge that gap to your point about the, the young high school woman who was not willing to because it was it could prove detrimental to her and her 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 ongoing future and experience to be able to to take that leap to try that thing that might be a little bit different. So I, I, I appreciate that very much. And the other thing is 
I think helping the world understand that the informal space is also a great space to earn additional credit if necessary and the opportunity exists um, to, to get those industry stackable certs. Again, not because we're trying to push people into careers, but we're trying to help people, you know, earn credentials that make sense for them, that they're excited about, that might make their journey a little bit easier further down the road um, and a whole host of other pieces, you know, sort of in that mix. And so I, I appreciate those elements about the work that you're doing as well. Um, I always sort of like to close the conversation, recognizing that there are people out in the world that have been listening to this and are thinking, oh my gosh, TechCore is awesome. You know, Lisa Chambers, I need to, to, to get in touch with her and find out, but, I, but I'm in a place that doesn't have TechCore, that doesn't have that particular opportunity. What, what's, what's some low hanging fruit that you would give a teacher or an informal community member who is just really looking to say, I wanna do something like this for my own community? Well, I feel like I appreciate that question. Um, I feel like I can say today that there are a lot more resources than there were when I had to answer that question 10 or 15 years ago. <laughs> Um, it's, at TechCore, we love um, the open source community. We mm -hmm. love how many tools there are available that are open source, that are free for parents and kids to download. Um, I absolutely love the Scratch community. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think it's a great place. And I think Scratch is a great tool of um, object-oriented uh, kind of uh, coding language. But it's so incredibly user friendly. There's mm -hmm. so many resources tied to it. You can, you know, do something very, very. Um, we we use it with our elementary school programs, but we've also pushed our high school kids yep. to do this. There's a very complicated code on there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that that's that's a great tool. There's another. Um, there's a national organization called um, CS for All Teachers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, which is starting to, to do some just really good advocacy work and, and putting out some tools. So, so if you're a teacher that is interested in, in those things, um, you know, I, I think that they're a great group. Um, and yeah, I, I, yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's just so much more out there. I will say the, the one thing that I often like to, to have our parents think about is when you're looking for for these um, informal computer science programs, and even in your schools, mm -hmm. um, you know, really pull the, the the sheets back and look at the students that they're serving. Yeah. Right. Because I think the last thing we want to do is you don't want to send your child somewhere, um, and just when they walk in the classroom, they don't feel like they see yeah. themselves right. or they feel safe and supported, and not. You know, and, and we're just not there yet mm -hmm. in, in all mm -hmm. of our programs. So it's important to ask questions about, you know, the, the demographics of the students that are attending, the demographics of the staff, you know, that are, are working with students. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a, a, a father tell me a story. He said, I think I ruined my daughter. He said, basically, I sent her to this coding camp and he was like she was there for the whole week she's the only girl in the program oh, and yeah. she kind of came back and said I'm never doing that yeah. again yeah. and he said I I should have asked you know mm -hmm. and I and I think it is important mm -hmm. um because we're still and you know I mean I think this has been pretty clear in the in the press that, that we're still dealing with some harsh spaces oh yeah and unfortunately that trickles down mm -hmm. um all the way and mm -hmm. so so it's important for us to make sure that we're building those safe and supportive environments. And I think, you know, there's just some that are, are getting there sooner than, than others. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Great, great parting advice. So Lisa, thank you so much for taking time out of your day and joining us. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. It's great work, so I appreciate it. Absolutely.